We've already looked at how dangerous the Hells Angels were, and in such criminal organizations, there is always an attempt by the police to go undercover. And Hells Angels was no exception. But the revelations of the organization were stranger than expected. In today's video, we'll look at the undercover chapter of the Hells Angels and the revelations it brought. Let's get started. An undercover agent who successfully infiltrated the notorious Hells Angels Motorbike Club had divulged the Hells Angels' stringent sex regulations. Jay Dobins, who is now 61 years old, was working for the ATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, when he spent two years looking into the Hells Angels as part of a covert operation to uncover the illegal organization that the gang was involved in. Between 2001 and 2003, he adopted the fictitious identity of Jay Davis or Jay Bird. He pretended to be a gun runner and debt collector, joining the organization's chapter in Mesa, Arizona. After he had been successful in getting an invitation to join, he rapidly learned about the stringent regulations that all members were required to follow regarding having sex with women. Otherwise, they risked experiencing some violent consequences. In a video interview with Insider, he revealed the regulations by saying that there is a hierarchy within the gang concerning women. Some older women are the wives or girlfriends of members, and you're not allowed to talk to them. If you get caught trying to play around with a member's wife or girlfriend, there is a harsh price to pay, and you had better not get caught trying to do that. Dobins did, however, explain that the bikers were allowed to sleep around with different women and that it wasn't a problem when members slept with the same woman more than once. He continued by saying that women also moved from member to member. The Hells Angels Motorcycle Club was established in Fontana, California in 1948. However, they have since grown into one of the most infamous motorcycle clubs in the world, with more than 100 chapters spread throughout more than 29 countries. Dobin's infiltration of the Hells Angles was part of Operation Black Biscuit, an investigation conducted into the gang after a violent clash between them and their arch-rivals, the Mongols Motorcycle Club. The organization became recognized for its affiliation with dangerous criminal operations, and Dobin's infiltration of the Hells Angles was a part of that inquiry. During the investigation, it was discovered that he had staged the murder of an opposing gang member by utilizing blood and guts from the butcher shop to create a horrific murder scene. He also faked drug transactions. Dobins disclosed that during the period he spent within the inner circle of the Hells Angels, he was made aware of more stringent regulations about how members interacted with one another. These rules had harsh repercussions if they were violated. One such rule was that whenever you meet a Hells Angel and have your sunglasses on, you had better lift your sunglasses up and look that person in the eye. It was also recommended to him that if he was wearing riding gloves, he should remove them before shaking hands with a Hells Angel. Another rule, which we looked at in our previous video, was never to touch a Hells Angel's patch, and under no circumstances should you slap them on the back. But he was the one who committed those mistakes and was punished for them. On occasion, he was even spanked for them. The former agent also disclosed that those who left the Hells Angels on bad terms were subject to having any possessions associated with the gang seized from them, including removing any tattoos they may have had. He also added that if you're out terrible, they will come and take back their cut, their vest. They will take back your motorcycle because in their eyes, it is their property. Dobins also said that many Hells Angels members aren't involved in a lot of crime, which is ironic considering the group's notoriety as a gang that engages in various criminal activities. He stated that some branches of the gang run a fairly clean business, adding that it was a fallacy that every member was a drug addict and claiming that some were fitness freaks. He also stated that the notion that every member was an addict was a lie. They ate healthily, got plenty of rest, and didn't drink or smoke, which paid off for them. But according to the United States Department of Justice, the undercover investigation did reveal evidence that the Hells Angels were involved in multiple illegal acts, including but not limited to murder, the production and distribution of methamphetamine, the distribution of cocaine, heroin, and marijuana, as well as the purchase and sale of firearms. Fifty-five members of the Hells Angels and its affiliates were indicted as a result of Operation Black Biscuit. 
This included 16 high-ranking members of the gang who were indicted on counts including murder, murder for hire, racketeering, and drug trafficking. After entering into plea deals, the charges against half of the defendants were dropped or reduced, and five of the defendants had their cases completely dismissed. After the arrests were made, the members learned that Dobbins was actually working with the government, and he claims that after that, both he and his family began to get threats of violence. The threats against him and his family started piling up, and the Hells Angels had murder contracts on him. When his family's home was destroyed by fire in 2008, the purported threats were too real for him and his loved ones. Even though they were sound sleeping inside the house during the terrifying event, his wife and children miraculously made it through it unscathed and were able to flee. Dobins has stated that he betrayed his family by putting the undercover investigation ahead of ensuring the safety of his loved ones, yet he has continued to speak out about the operation following his retirement. Apparently, he is not the only one who tried to investigate the Hells Angels. Another even more interesting investigation was done as a result of Joshua O'Brien. Well, in simple terms, things did not turn out well for him. After being suffocated and battered, Joshua O'Brien regained consciousness on July 12th inside the Cool Cats Tattoo Parlor in Englewood. He had his hands and ankles bound and was bleeding. With Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club members all about him, shop owner Dusty Ulrich began blacking off O'Brien's death head tattoo, the symbol of membership in the famed biker club. In its place, Ulrich scribbled the word bad into O'Brien's skin, while other Hell's Angels snapped photos on their phones. And in the middle, Ulrich threatened him that if he ever told anyone about it, Ulrich would kill him and slit his throat. However, O'Brien informed the police of what had occurred, initiating a five-month investigation into the famed bikers that culminated when investigators raided the Hells Angels clubhouse in Denver's Highland District. Officials confiscated methamphetamine, cocaine, cash, and dozens of firearms during the early morning raids there and elsewhere. Thirteen Hells Angels members, aged 30 to 81, were charged with breaching Colorado's organized crime legislation and assault, burglary, and kidnapping offenses. A 14th member of the Destroyer Motorcycle Gang was also charged. Because their arrest affidavits were withheld, the accusations against the 14 men remained hidden for months. However, prosecutors presented their case against the Hells Angels in Denver County Court earlier this month during preliminary hearings for three defendants, and their arrest affidavits were revealed when a Denver Post reporter requested that the documents be unsealed. According to an arrest document, the entire case revolves around O'Brien, the former member who claimed he was beaten by men he previously called his brothers after they feared he was talking to law police during an earlier search on his Lakewood motorcycle store. O'Brien informed investigators that the Hells Angels Denver chapter was involved in meth stash houses, prostitutes, gun sales, and money laundering across the country. According to an arrest affidavit, O'Brien told investigators, if you want loves and hugs, you go to the Rocky Mountain chapter you go to the Denver Charter if you want guns and drugs. In court, Hells Angels defense attorneys stated that the prosecution based its whole case on the word of a man who had warrants out for his arrest in various counties for drug possession, car theft, and failing to appear in court. During the hearing, Hells Angels President Jason Sellers' lawyer, Brian Russo, said that it doesn't take a huge leap to understand he had the motive to fabricate that he was in serious trouble with the law and with the people he asked for help. He became overwhelmed and took advantage of the first opportunity to create this story. O'Brien told detectives that before things went wrong, he had devoted his life to the Hells Angels, giving up his spouse and his successful career. Everything changed when Lakewood police raided his motorcycle store and arrested O'Brien on weapons charges. One of the Hells Angels rules is that members do not speak with law enforcement. According to the arrest complaint, O'Brien assumed the others were frightened because he was. On June 28, 2019, O'Brien told authorities that he was ambushed by a bunch of Hells Angels at an eerie stash house and was assaulted, shot at, and stabbed before fleeing. Then in July, 
He was beaten in a garage and dragged to an Englewood tattoo parlor, where his tattoos were covered up, a practice utilized by the Hells Angels when they want someone out. According to the arrest document, O'Brien claimed he was left wounded in a Denver alley while the Hells Angels stole thousands of dollars in tools, motorcycles, and cash from him. O'Brien phoned authorities from the Jefferson County Jail a week after the July incident and told investigators about the organization's composition and the scope of their illegal conduct throughout a series of interviews. He claimed that he had four pounds of meth from the cartel in his Lakewood shop before the raid, headed for Hell's Angels chapters in other states. O'Brien claimed to know the locations of stash homes in Minnesota and Arizona, and that the club had informants in law enforcement in the Denver metro region who provided them with information about investigations and raids. The gang also steals motorcycles for parts and conducts a high number of arms deals, according to O'Brien's testimony in the arrest complaint. It is unknown whether law enforcement was targeting stash houses or chapters in other states. In addition to the overall organized crime accusations, the members of the Denver chapter face two assaults on O'Brien in June and July. Defense attorneys indicated that they wanted to assault O'Brien's credibility. When speaking with detectives, he omitted critical details of his tale, such as not informing them he stole a truck in Erie the night he was assaulted. Russo told the judge that the government was aware that the evidence they relied on came from someone who had no connection to the truth, and they were well aware that they had issues with this witness. The Hells Angels of Denver have a history of avoiding legal issues when police officials seek them. The city paid $50,000 to settle a lawsuit in 2003 after 18 members were thrown to the ground outside their offices and imprisoned for hours despite police discovering no evidence of illegal activities, and the city formally apologized. What do you think of these two sides of the story? Share your thoughts in the comment section below, and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button for more content. Until next time, stay safe.